Please welcome Bradford M. Freeman, Managing Director of Global Policy at the George W. Bush Institute, David Kramer. Good morning, good morning. Our nation's calling, it's the title of this forum. It's also a theme that runs through all of our work on the domestic side and on the global side, and it's the global side that I focus on. You see it in our work on human freedom, where we support democracy and human rights activists around the world. <clears throat> we ad advance civil society around the world, and we also raise awareness about the growing threats coming from authoritarian regimes. We do it through our democracy talks, our catalysts, our scholarship programs, and it's great work that's been done here for, for many years. We also do it through our women's initiative, and you saw evidence of that earlier today with Natalie and Dr. Yacoubi here, where we try to make sure that women are in fact empowered. We want to make sure that half of the world's population, women, have the same rights as the other half of the population, men. And we want to make sure that they also have access to healthcare, education, and all the other things that make for a better and more prosperous and safer society for all of us. And then, of course, most relevant to this panel that we're about to have now is our work on global health, where we have really talked about the impact that the President's PEPFAR initiative has had. Next year, we'll mark the 20th anniversary of PEPFAR, we're also on cervical cancer. This work literally saves lives, and it's uh, some of this work that we want to focus on here on this panel. All of this work, by the way, really goes hand in hand with each other. The more democratic a society is, the more likely women will be empowered, the more likely public health will be tended to appropriately. And so all of these things come together as one, and that's why I think the work that the Bush Institute is, is so critically important. Th this panel, by the way, is uh, sponsored by Smoothie King, so we want to thank them for helping us get this together. Um, and we have uh, a panel with the uh, title, Compa uh, Courage and Compassion, America's Leadership in Global Health. And we have two outstanding speakers to join us here today, Dr. Deborah Burks and Dr. Stephen Hahn, if I could ask them to come on out. David, thank you. Hi. So, uh, Dr. Stephen Hahn is the former commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration and now CEO and partner at Flagship Pioneering and also CEO of uh, Harbinger Health. And Dr. Deborah Burks is uh, one of our own, uh, a senior fellow here at the Bush Institute. We're thrilled to have you. And also, of course, the uh, former U.S. Global AIDS Coordinator and also the U.S. Special Representative for Global Health Diplomacy. Both, I think, are familiar faces from TV over the past few years, <laughs> but we're delighted that you're here with us in person. So, uh, Dr. Burks, let me, let me start with you and just ask you about the importance of U.S. leadership when it comes to global health. Health. Why should the U.S. play such an important role, obviously with allies, but why is it so important for the United States to take the lead? Well, believe it or not, we're the only bilateral programs almost anywhere in the world um, at this point. And what do I mean by that? That means that the U.S. is one of the few countries that still has Americans on the ground working on health issues in partnership with countries and communities. Um, many other countries have moved to funding the Global Fund for HIV, TB, and malaria, and other um, global health programs that confront um, maternal mortality and health, other health issues. Um, but in doing so, they often removed a lot of their bilateral presence. And why is that important? Well, we all know that the best way to get things done is to work in partnership every day, not on Zoom, in the person, with the communities, listening to communities, and working with governments. And I, I was so impressed when um, President Bush always talks about compassion. But what people, in my mind, what he means by that is humility to listen to others. Um, because you really can't have compassion for others unless you're listening to others. And I think that's what PEPFAR has done, which has tackled HIV. That is what the President's Malaria Initiative has done that's tackled malaria. That is what the Millennium Challenge Corporation has done. And those are all 
programs that were set up during the Bush administration. And I think that translation of compassion into partnerships by listening and being humble by not realizing you don't know everything is so critical for US relationships. I think the one thing that's always missing, David, and it always drives me crazy, is foreign policy groups always meet and they never include health. And the health sector is critical for cultures to thrive, for communities to thrive, for women to thrive. They have to be healthy. And so I really, I've always pushed for foreign policy to be embedded in the health of the nation. And I think the US recognize that and does that. And I don't think you have successful foreign policy and relationships unless you have successful health programs. Dr. Hein, let me turn to you and ask you, from coming out of the COVID pandemic, there, there was amazing and rapid success in development and distribution of vaccines. How, how does that uh, portend for future biomedical innovations? And a lot of people would ask, if we can do that so quickly for COVID, coming up with a vaccine, why can't we do that for other threatening diseases? Well, thanks, David. And first of all, I want to thank uh, President and Mrs. Bush. It's really an honor to be here. Thank you very much. And believe it or not, it's great to be on camera again with Dr. Bush. <laughs> 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 and I really mean that. So, so, David, it's a really good point you're making. And um, when I went to the agency, I established three priorities, and one of them was let's advance innovation. There's so much going on, particularly in biotech, but in medicine in general. And you know, the, the Human Genome pro Project, et cetera, and the development of medical products to, to really combat serious diseases. And so what could we do to, to spur innovation? And boy, that was before COVID, and boy, did we have to really spur innovation during COVID, prioritizing science and, you know, the most important medical products to combat the disease. And so we learned something about ourselves, I think, as a country, as a world, and at the agency, for sure, and that is we can do this. Identification of the virus, in January, first authorization of a vaccine in December, 11 months. That is, I think we called it a, a grand slam, a medical miracle at the time. It, we didn't expect that to occur, but it showed that we can do it when we come together around a common purpose. So I think it's right to ask the question, why can't we do that every day of every year to actually to address some of the most urgent human medical needs that we have? So there's lots of things that we can think about for doing that, but the the, the approaches that were used during that time of bringing the private sector together with government, with academia, I think can work in normal times. And just one major point for me and one takeaway, it's why I didn't go back to academia, um, but, but went into the private sector, is that if we didn't learn the importance of a robust private sector and having to do everything possible to reduce barriers to innovation and enabling the private sector during COVID, then we'll never really learn that lesson. And so it's really important that we maintain that. We have the appropriate oversight, but that we really foster that innovation that comes from the, the private sector. But let me, let me push you a little bit. Do we need a kind of mass mobilization to address the danger of cancer, for example? President Biden has talked about the, uh, the space shot, I think, is the term he's used. Um, is, is the approach that, that you, Dr. Burks, and others took to address the COVID threat, something we need for that, or can we do it other ways? Well, I think we have to do it other ways. It's not sustainable sure. what happened during COVID. And I mean, Deb, maybe you have a different point of view here, but it was an extraordinary time and it was a public health emergency. So of course, extraordinary measures are taken and um, we, won't, we won't need to have some of the measures we had in place, but think about some of the things for enabling, you know, moving innovation forward, like at the agency, it was revol ro ro rolling reviews, interactions with the sponsors, really helping them understand what they needed to do to answer the questions that the regulators need to approve a product. There's lots of things that can be put in place that I think that should be normal for us. Very controversial would be accelerated approval of medical products because we've seen a lot in the press about that. But the bottom line is there are things that government can do to provide the appropriate oversight to make sure the products are safe and effective, but at the same time, get out of the way. Uh, Deb, let me ask you about an all of government approach. Uh, some people might think it's the CDC, the NIH, FDA, uh, HHS, sound like an alphabet soup, but um, <laughs> uh, Pentagon gets involved, State Department gets involved. Um, there's a lot uh, that need to um, get involved in all of these to, to make a successful campaign. 
You know, that's what PEPFAR proved to us. Um, so it wasn't that President Bush believed that we could get two million people on treatment, which at the time I can tell you was frightening. I just want to be clear. That was a very frightening number because there was really no one on treatment in sub-Saharan Africa. And I think the vision of that we are stronger as whole of government, um, but many people, particularly the private sector, doesn't understand that the federal government is essentially against change <laughs> and yeah. against doing things in a big, different way. You stay in the federal government um, either because you've learned how to make it work and get things done really quickly and there's big money and you can get big money doing great things, or it's, it's a safe place. Mm -hmm. um, and so when presidents come in and want to initiate a new program like PEPFAR, there is a lot of bickering among the federal workforce. Um, some look at the trajectory and say, I think we can outlast him. <laughs> and they're like, okay, let's just put on the, let's not a lot <laughs> and not do it. Um, and so change management in the federal government, and I've had to do it three times, is very difficult. PEPFAR was a huge inflection point in change management because it said we are stronger as whole of government. And I will tell you 19 years later, the agencies are still arguing about where PEPFAR should reside. Yet, the brilliance of putting it in the State Department said that we need a coordinator that doesn't have self-interest in getting money for themselves. Mm -hmm. And so the State Department puts out the money based on results, accountability, and progress in a very transparent manner and the agencies implement. But the State Department in that way then can hold the agencies accountable for implementation. And we implement through DOD because DOD has unique relationships with ministries of defense and obviously soldiers and sailors are at risk for many of these infectious diseases. Um, USAID has a unique ability to work in a specific way with some of the community groups, CDC, with ministries of health. And so, and we brought in Treasury because some of this required um, reforms of tax collection to create sustainable programs. And I think so, that kind of whole of government was the same whole of government approach to COVID. And that's why, um, in a way, it was a little bit easier for me because I was used to coordinating a lot of agencies that didn't always get along, um, but agreed on the mission, um, but didn't always agree that one agency should get more money than they do. So um, in the federal government, and sometimes results aren't as important as how much money you're able to get <laughs> and how many people you employ um, in that um, particular agency. So turning into a results-driven program was absolutely critical. And I think a vertical program that created horizontal cap capacity was exactly what Sub-Saharan Africa needed to respond to COVID. So, I, sometimes when you do these things, you don't know that you're creating something bigger. I mean, we're extraordinarily successful in HIV around the, around the globe, but at the same time, we created a response of human capacity, data, knowledge, access, um, community engagement that was absolutely critical for COVID. And talk a little more, if you would, about a data-driven process, because I know this is, this is a very important issue to you. Um, how receptive were other parts of the government to that, and how were you able to get that done? Well, you know, PEPFAR, MCC, PMI, all of the infectious disease programs that were set up were results-driven. But um, I could see um, when I took over in 2014 um, that it wasn't enough to just measure inputs and outputs, that we had to really move to outcomes and impact. Um, and so we decided that in order to hold people accountable, you had to be completely transparent. And that's the other piece of this that I think sometimes we forget in battling pandemics. Critical that all of your data is in the public arena and is transparent. So the communities, the governments, the partners see their results, how they're performing next to others, um, what they need to do to improve. Um, and when it's all public, so all of the PEPFAR data is at pepfar.gov is public and it's completely transparent. We could learn a lesson here in the United States about that. Um, that's how we made progress because that's how you see who you're missing. 
Um, data is only helpful if it creates an action. And I think you see that in the Bush Institute today. They collect the data, but it's not to have a data and publish a pamphlet. It's to change a policy to have an action. And I think we in PEPFAR were very dedicated to using data to point out where we had a problem. And to be honest, we had to bring in the private sector. You know, we got 15 years into the program and we finally looked deep dive into our data and realized that we were missing all the men, at least 50% of the men because men, healthy men don't come to clinics in Africa. Could be a problem here in the U.S. too. <laughs> healthy Probably men out is. there. Steve, uh, Steve and I will <laughs> skip over that. Um, we're gonna but, that you know, we had the private sector come in and, t and talk to men. Can you imagine that? Sitting down with male groups and saying, what do you really need in order to come to the clinic? Well, you need to be open at 6.30 on the way to work. It can't take a long time. By the way, we don't want women physicians. We think they gossip. We do not. We don't find you that interesting. We, we do, actually. <laughs> we are not oh, yeah. gossiping about you. Um, but we met the men where they were with their needs. Um, and I think sometimes when we look at data by a state, we lose the nuances, and I think that's happening today between the rural areas and urban areas, and we're missing the structural barriers to access to health care that exist in our rural areas. And you know, just to follow up what Deb said, I think we could tie together those two points. And your leadership um, in the White House at that time was just so critical because for me, connecting the dots between the data and the transparency, and then the outcomes. You, you said both are important, and if you don't have the data, or you have faulty data, you're not really measuring the right outcomes. And it wasn't until Deb had sort of built the infrastructure during COVID for us to look at these data that we could start to figure out and ask and then answer some questions. And so I'm thinking about supply chain, distribution of products that were authorized, et cetera, real problems that we had at least at the beginning of the, the pandemic. But there are problems that need to be solved now and we need to have an infrastructure around data, the transparency, et cetera. You know, it's shocking. We can get HIV drugs to the most rural village in Africa. I'm not sure that we can say that about antivirals here in the United States. Or so I, I, I think, you know, there are lessons learned from global programs that are executed by Americans in partnership on the ground who are learning from communities, learning from governments, learning what works, and translating that back home to improve our systems. But is that a function of logistics? Is it a function of political will? Is it a function of societal resistance? How, how do you explain that? It's a function of data. So not to scare anyone, because Owen just said I shouldn't scare anyone. But if you go on a website today and you look at where the level one trauma sites are, and you look that they're in the urban areas, and a lot of Americans don't live in urban areas, mm -hmm. and you've heard about the golden hour, um, a lot of Americans are way past that golden hour um, and to get to those level one trauma centers. And so I think it's a matter of what we did in PEPFAR, and I think it changed everything. Um, we came into PEPFAR in 2014, and we mapped every single service delivery site that we had um, so that we could see every place we were working and understand was it reaching the community. So we did this geospatial mapping. We put it all together, and I couldn't understand why near the lake in Kenya, people were still dying at the disproportionate rate. So I could see people dying, I didn't know why. I mapped everything and I realized that if you were in a Lua region, which is one of the tribes out in that area near Lake Kasumu, that you had more than five or 10 miles to get to a clinic. If you were anywhere else in Kenya, it was two and a half. So, you know, it's just not the number of things, it's where those things are. And that kind of critical geospatial mapping, I learned from the private sector who taught us that and how they decide whether to put in another Starbucks or not. I mean, you really need to learn from the private sector, use the techniques that they use to bring in better delivery and better infrastructure. And so if you go right now to the ASPR website, you can see where there are therapeutics available for COVID. Um, right now, 
you know, there's a lot of rural parts of America that don't have immediate access. Those are the kind of structural barriers that we addressed in PEPFAR to ensure that every mother had access as soon as she found out she was pregnant to antivirals to save herself and her child. Um, that's the kind of timing and kind of urgency we need to bring to our healthcare response. Steve, I want to, both of you have touched on the role of the private sector, and I want you to uh, dive into that a little more. In your previous position, you were getting political pressure, you were getting pressure from the pharmaceutical industry, um, and yet you also had a process to follow, and you also had the recognition that without the private sector, much of what you both were trying to accomplish would not have happened. So how, how do you view the role of the private sector and the interaction with the government? So uh, I think one thing that really helped was that the agency, the FDA, had moved beyond this concept that the private sector was in fact an enemy um, and that working with the private sector was really important to bring medical products to, to the American people and the world. And I think recognizing that the FDA's patient was the American people and that our job was to get as speedily but as safely as possible great medical products to them was really important. So it started kind of with a cultural change that has taken place over the last 10 to 15 years at, at the FDA. But then we're in the middle of a, a medical emergency we need diagnostics, we need ventilators, we need personal protective equipment, we need therapeutics, et cetera, and of course a vaccine. And so there was really only one way of that occurring, and that was engagement with the private sector. So we had to rethink the way that we were going to approach this, and we had this uh, legislation from President uh, Bush's time that allowed us to have emergency use authorization, which was enormously helpful and provided a flexibility around what we could do. So first of all, instead of first in, first out, it was let's prioritize on the basis of science and impact. What's, what are we going to look at first in line that's going to have the greatest impact and save lives? So that was one example of that. But, but the processes in general were let's engage the private sector early, often, give really good guidance about what needs to be done so that we can ensure to the American people that we're doing the absolute best job for uh, safety and efficacy. But let me emphasize one other point, and this is something that as a doc you know all the time, you have to be pragmatic. You see someone in the emergency room, you have a limited amount of information. You're gonna make the best decision you can in an emergency situation. When you gather more data and then the intensive care unit on the floor, you're gonna update your diagnosis and your treatment. This is what we had to do at the agency. This is what the government had to do. This is what Deb brought from her experience at PEPFAR. The decisions aren't gonna be perfect. We have to recognize that. We have to be transparent about it, but we need to constantly update them. And that's not because your doctor or whoever was wrong, it's because we have more information. And this was happening in real time. So there's a lot of lessons that can be learned that could speed this and that could really sort of enable our interaction. And this could be done on a regular basis every day. Let me ask a question for both of you, and maybe Steve, start with you. The, the issue of health equity. Um, how can you address this so that uh, a pandemic or even something short of a pandemic does not exacerbate the inequalities that we see globally as well as in this country too. Yeah, this is a really important subject. We've been talking about health disparities in cancer doc in cancer for years. And um, it, there's a couple of issues that I think are important. One is an access issue, it's a structural yeah. issue. Yeah. Um, and, and a trend that we have now for remote care, for digital health, for what we're calling decentralized approaches to care where you go to someone's home, that's going to help because it'll help in rural America, it'll help with, uh, with some of the less accessible places in our big cities. Um, but the other part of this is trust. And um, I think we saw, Deb, that there was a significant trust gap with many underserved communities and big government, big medicine, you know, industry, et cetera, that really needs to be bridged. And one of our jobs moving forward, I think, is to rebuild that trust, that science and medicine and data can really do good in the world, that we have to engage again early and often and try to find ways to incent the private sector to help us improve that access and rebuild that trust. And I think we can. There's a number of potentially novel ways to incent the private sector to do this, and I think they will, the private sector writ large, will help us get there. I'm very optimistic because of the trends I'm seeing in medicine right now, but we really have to have a sustained effort on this. And Deb, on the, on the global scale, uh, it, the impression has been that it's the richer developed countries that were getting access to 
vaccines and treatment and so on in the poor countries simply weren't, that this was the way things were unfolding. Is that a fair description? And if so, how do we fix that for the next time? Yeah, I think, um, and that's why I brought up that, that example of Kenya, and that's why um, deep granular data is, imp is mm -hmm. important. You can't just, no business person would say, because I got to drive through Midland, Texas, I discovered so much of the United States being able to drive. If, um, I got to every state but three, and um, well, I didn't get to Hawaii and Alaska, other people got to go there, um, but that was too far to, for me to take that now on the time. But in driving the country, I got to drive um, through Midland. Um, and no one that runs a business in Midland would say, in general, through all of my wells, I'm pumping X amount. They would know exactly what right. each well was producing. And that's the kind of granularity you need when you're dealing with pandemics if you want to change the course of that pandemic. You can't um, just go where the concentrations of people are. You have to go where people live. And I think where everyone lives. And you have to have a program that works for everyone. And I think that's what PEPFAR, and, and let's be clear, every, every infectious disease pandemic is political. Mm -hmm. They all have been political. It doesn't matter if it's Zika or Ebola or HIV, TB or malaria, they're political. The thing that data does and granular data does is it says to the ministry, you have residents in your country who can't access care. Um, and then it becomes um, not perception-based, not risk-based, not finger-pointing-based. It just says, we have to do something different here. And then it means you have to move resources, or it means you have to change policies. When we started to really tackle the problem of HIV in young women who were 10 times at risk of young men at the same age group to HIV, we had to address women's lives as a whole. And that's what we'll take globally, is to address this equity issue, you have to address people's lives as a whole. And I think um, the, one th the other thing that the innovation that PEPFAR brought was this ability to have a waiver to allow the best drugs from our incredible pharmaceutical companies to immediately be handed off as a licensure to a generic company who produced them in high volume and at low cost. So my cost to treat someone in, in Sub-Saharan Africa is about $105 a year. Here it's probably 15,000. And so, but it's the same drugs. Oh. And that's what PEPFAR did. It created for resource limited settings an option we could be doing that right now with vaccines and with the new therapeutics for COVID. Um, it provide that waiver so that resource limited settings has the access to what we have. And Steve, can you talk a little more about the generic drugs? Because this also, as you just said, it plays into the disparities that we see. Why do we not seem so efficient at that? So uh, again, um, and I, I was thinking the same thing relating this to generic drugs when Deb was talking because, you know, and it was highlighted during COVID because the lack of data around our supply chain for pharmaceuticals, but for medical products in general, is substantial. And I'll just, a little anecdote, you know, at the height of PPE shortages, et cetera, and certain drug shortages, we had people at the FDA calling other countries in the middle of the night, I mean, literally 24 seven, to find out about where precursors of drugs and drugs were being manufactured, whether they were going to be released. And, and so there isn't really a central way to access data about the most essential medicines that we use. Um, and, and that lack of data allows us to have some, you know, confusion, et cetera, about access to these drugs. Now, with respect to generics, we all probably know that very important part of medical care in the U.S., a, a significant percentage of Americans are on generic drugs, and, and rightfully so, but 90% of those are manufactured overseas. And during COVID, there were export bans, as you might expect, because of concern, national security concerns, et cetera. And so what that highlighted for us was a vulnerability. So 
you know, we have to really think about, number one, the supply chain, but number two, about some domestic manufacturing around essential medicines and essential products like personal protective equipment, et cetera, so that we ensure the next time something like this happens that we have a ready supply and that we actually know where that supply is. And so I, I think there are certainly solutions to this, but it starts with the data, understanding where it is, and the transparency around it. During the height of the pandemic, we ran out of a sedative called propofol. So this is a drug that we use in medicine for people who are on ventilators so that they don't wake I up. never let people know that. What? That we were running out of a well, central drug. All right, that didn't help. I didn't help. want to frighten anybody. It, 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 was, it was on TV, so, you know. We will yeah. edit the tape on But it system. didn't get a lot of pickup. No, and my yeah. point about it is that. This is why we never slept. We, exactly, like slept. <laughs> we found a way to, to provide access from, from other countries that allowed us to, to address that shortage. But the other thing is there's advanced manufacturing techniques. There are machines, basically, that can manufacture enough propofol for an entire city for an entire year in 24 hours, basically, or something along those lines. My point is there are advanced techniques that we could put in this country right now that would allow us to address some of these issues. And you heard that from the last panel. Yeah. about the vulnerability of our supply chain. Everything that you heard about, our, everything that you conceptually know about energy independence, take that to a concept of medical treatment independence. And we are about the 1960s of where our energy was. Um, so, <laughs> of independence. So. Um, this is something that is absolutely critical because I, I can't tell you what it was like to be sitting in task force and having our supply chain, and I just want to say they were amazing. They came from the Joint Chiefs. Um, the Joint Chiefs gave us their best logistics people to save America, and when he comes in and says, we don't have any more, and you're just like, oh my God. I mean, everybody on a ventilator needs this. Right. Otherwise, they fight the ventilator. So it was, it was critical to saving people's lives. So as much as our vulnerability was in the 70s to um, energy, that is where we exist right now in medicine and medicine treatments, medical, treat, medical therapies, ph the pharmaceutical precursors. That's where we are as a country. And I think you know, we have to take this very seriously. And it's a solvable problem. I mean, yes. The solutions are out there and we can leapfrog from being in the 60s to being in 2022. That would be good. Um, uh, vaccine diplomacy. Um, I, I want to ask both of you about is competition, say, with Russia and China, where both countries try to send the vaccines to other countries, particularly countries that we might not have at the top of our list. Um, is that a healthy thing? Um, or is that another sign of co global competition? It, it, that's, start with you, Deb, and then Steve, also with you, your sense of the approval process here compared to the approval process in, say, uh, Moscow and Beijing. You know, it's very interesting to me because the U.S. has been on the forefront of working with countries to save lives for now decades, building infrastructure through PEPFAR, um, saving babies and mothers and, and the parents and grandparents. Um, so we had trusting relationships in, the, in these countries. But data and knowing before others leads other actors to be able to swoop in and say, we have something better, buy it from us. Now remember, we weren't asking people to buy it from us. We were, as a compassionate nation, saying we want to translate what we have to save other lives, and it just didn't result in surviving. It's, now these countries are thriving. I, I think we have to be cognizant of people using vaccines and, and health and health commodities in that manner. Mm -hmm. Um, and in using it in a very different manner than the United States would ever use it. Um, and to use it as actually you know, a marketing um, and actually going in and saying, we'll build you a road, but it's gonna cost you X. Um, and so I think we have to be very aware of that. I think, I think the countries are very aware of that. I think sometimes we are very quiet. You know, we believe our actions speaks louder than words, and that's true, they do. But sometimes people have to be reminded of the actions and reminded that PEPFARS saved 20 million 
lives. I mean, we now have almost 19 million people on life-saving treatment because of a vision that President Bush had and that for some reason he believed in us more than we believed in ourselves and created a leadership role that says, I have your back. Um, and you do what you need to do and work as hard as you can and we'll get you what you need to be successful. And I think that's, that's part of a great leader is being to inspire people to be better than they think they are. Um, and so I think countries understand that the United States has been standing beside them. And I think sometimes we need to remind people that we are there for their population and we stand with their population for democracy, for access to health care, and ensure people can thrive. But I think in this moment, we should be doing that again. And I think a part of that is also transparency. I still don't have all of the data from any of the other vaccines produced by um, other countries. And I think without that level of transparency and data, we can't even recommend to countries whether this product works or not. And I think that put us in a very difficult position to not know whether the Russian vaccine or the Chinese vaccine was as effective as the vaccines that have been made in this country or made in Europe. And so I think that's a very difficult place that we were in and there does need to be much more transparency. And I think the WHO needs to play a role in that. They need to, and again, it doesn't, have, it shouldn't be secret data. It shouldn't be only shown to the WHO or only shown, but it needs to be put in a public way because that's how you rebuild trust is making it very clear to people what things do. Steve, how'd you see it from your vantage point? Well, first of all, um, we know we can do this. PEPFAR, 18.5 million people have received antiretroviral agents who otherwise wouldn't have received those probably without PEPFAR. So we know we can do this around the world, which is just terrific to know that we can. But, but Deb brings up a really good point about this, um, and that is the transparency we have, um, and, and you could argue it needs to be better, around our system of medical product development, of course protecting confidential commercial information, but around the process that's used to develop. And I can't believe I'm saying this, but you know, the press did a reasonable job of talking um, about what it was needed to develop a vaccine. And so the, the American people got an education about EUAs, randomized clinical trials, data safety monitoring boards. That education was really important and that transparency was really important. We didn't necessarily see that around the world. And one of the things that I think, and there's a lot to, there's a lot to criticize in terms of the slowness of the regulatory approach that, that we have. But one of the things that I think was really important was that transparency around this. And it did happen with speed. So I think more transparency around that is, ver is very necessary, knowing what the rules of the road are, but letting the American people see what it is that the process that we go through to actually make a decision about safety and efficacy. If that's there, they can make their own decision about whether they trust the decisions that we're making, and that's how it should work. And I think having a lot of you know, public meetings around vaccine advisory committees, et cetera, helped to provide that trust. You saw the public trust in vaccines go up during that time. I'm not saying that was directly related to that per se, but the overall transparency, I do believe, helped with that. So, so I, I think um, the lack of transparency and also about how those products were approved, but also about how they're working in the real world, that, that's problematic. And, you know, so we can't answer the question for you to compare and contrast. What I can tell you is, I dare say, there's been a medical product like our vaccines that are authorized right now in the U.S. that have been given to more people over a shorter people, a time around the world and that I, I dare say no, no, amount, no significant amount of data has been collected like it has for these medical products. And that is the sort of information that really helps us all make decisions about what we're going to do with our own personal health. We need more of that. I think the other piece that people forget is Africa has a lot of vaccine right now. Mm -hmm. The problem is not vaccine. The problem is getting it distributed yeah. and into people's arms. And I think we have a little bit of that here in the United States, but that's what, that's why data is so important is to understand who you've reached, who you haven't reached, why you haven't reached in them and what you're going to do to change it. Because um, I really don't like it when people just keep looking at data and say, we have a problem. And do nothing to, to create that solution. And I think what PEPFAR has demonstrated is you can address any problem 
if you allow yourself to move past your assumptions and your perceptions to the reality on the ground and really talk to people about what that barrier is and fix it. And I think that's what we're about, using data to fix the problem and fix what the issues are. And it's inexcusable right now that there's vaccines sitting um, in major capital cities in sub-Saharan Africa that hasn't been distributed. We've only got a few minutes left, but let me ask each of you, do you feel confident from the experience we've just had with COVID, appreciating it's not completely over yet, um, that we are better prepared for the next global health crisis that is going to come sometime soon? Hopefully not soon, but at some point. No. That, uh, the look on both of your faces was not terribly reassuring, I have to tell you. Uh, mine's going to be a no with a caveat, and that is okay. that I maintain hope that we will. That, you know, in medicine, there's this concept in quality called drift, where you sort of move away from the crisis and you move to normal times and you forget about how bad things were. Um, we have to avoid that, our political leadership, but also the American people, the, the medical providers, et cetera, because forgetting what happened to us is, w would be a huge mistake. And I think the trends of things in place like telemedicine, et cetera, are gonna help expedite this. But, but, but I don't think that we're prepared. And we really, in the age of information, there's no reason why we can't monitor and predict what the next outbreak's going to be. Now, we're dependent upon cooperation among countries, et cetera, but we should be thinking about how we're gonna build a health shield. And we need to extend this not just from infectious disease, but other chronic diseases. What are we doing to preempt diabetes, hypertension, you know, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, cancer, et cetera. We really need to be thinking about this in a preemptive sense. And top of the list is infectious diseases. And it, you know, we keep talking about it, it starts with data. If we don't actually know what's going on in the infectious disease world and what's being isolated where, we're blind blind. What I learned from PEPFAR and that execution on the ground was they were prepared with the platform needed in many ways to respond to their COVID pandemic. So imagine as a country, if we didn't look at global pandemic preparedness as something that happens in the box over here, but we use that central box as we did with PEPFAR to tackle the pandemics of obesity, diabetes, hypertension, opioids person by person, community by community, county by county, use data to say this is where they're making great progress over here. What did they do? Right. How can we learn from that? Because that's how we did it in PEPFAR. This clinic's doing great. They're retaining men that are 25 years old. We're having real trouble with that, getting them to come back every three months. How are we going to do that? Finding those solutions and finding what works creates the system to ensure that you're ready for the na next pandemic. If you look at this as a theoretic issue, that's something out there, and you don't use our main health system to tackle the pandemics we already have, and that's why I said no. So if we deal with rural health care, if we deal with our tribal nations, if we tackle um, the reality of our current pandemics, um, th th what you need to do at community level is no different um, in, a, in an infectious disease pandemic as what you need to do to deal with major health issues that this country is confronting. Well, in wrapping up, I do want to mention one last thing, and that is Ukraine is a PEPFAR country. Yes. And you're wearing the colors yes. of Ukraine. Steve and I are both wearing symbols on our lapels. Um, so obviously we hope <coughs> that Ukraine can get back to uh, dealing with this crisis uh, and not worry about uh, the invasion coming from, from the north. Um, Dr. Derber Bork, Burks, uh, Dr. Stephen Hahn, thanks so much for a fascinating conversation. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you much. Hold on one second. This announcement is brought to you by, uh, no, we're moving to the Hall of State for lunch, which is just out there. And then after lunch, please don't forget to come back for the keynote uh, conversation with General Mattis. Thank you again. Thank you, David. Thanks.